Welcome to The Weaver Sews. I'm Daryl Lancaster. There are many reasons to line a jacket, from creating a beautiful finish inside and hiding some of the construction details to making the inside slip on and off more easily. In a hand-woven jacket, to allow the fabric to grow and move as a handwoven wants to, typically I don't attach the lining to the lower edge of the garment, so the two can move independently of each other. In this swing coat, the handwoven fabric grew so much in length, the lining is now considerably shorter than the coat. There used to be just a half an inch or 1.2 centimeters difference. When I do attach the lining to the lower edge of a jacket, it's because I've stabilized the garment body in some way, usually with a fusible underlining. I've covered this in a previous video. Here are two jackets. One almost finished, except the lining, and the other also in need of a lining and a collar. I'll construct both linings at the same time. And because neither of these jackets have been supported with a fusible underlining, I'll leave the lining free at the lower edge. And that means that the lining will need to be finished up inside. So let's talk about what kinds of fabric to use for a lining. I'm a big believer in using what's on the shelf, and I'm not opposed to dyeing my own fabric. Look for fabrics with a crisp feel but that are slick enough to allow easy entry into the jacket, especially in the arms. I've used a lot of saris for linings, like in this coat, though the label says Dupioni silk, not in English. I figured that, they're, that they were more rayon, especially considering the price my husband paid when he brought them back from India. They take a press really well, so I know they aren't polyester, and a burn test supports that. You want the lining to have body, to be able to support the jacket. Fine fabrics like a 5 mommy weight, that would be 5mm, and mommy is spelt M-O-M-M-E, uh, that silk habitat and this silk chiffon are almost too fine, with no body at all. I prefer something with more meat in it. I avoid polyester linings. They don't breathe, and they do not take a press, which bugs me more than anything. I look through my stash for interesting things, like this hand-painted silk charmeuse I bought from Thai Silks a number of years ago. Charmeuse is super slippery, and it takes some patience to work with, but the results are gorgeous. Cottons can work if they're a little more fluid, especially if they have some sort of finish on them, uh, to allow them to be more slippery, like this hand-painted cotton I'm using for the Harris Tweed jacket. This fabric may have some silk content. I've long ago lost the remnant label. For the hand-woven jacket, I'm using a vintage silk kimono, which I bought in pieces from a shop on Whidbey Island that sold vintage Japanese goods. It has good body and good slickness. I love acetate linings. Acetate being one of the man-made fibers out of regenerated cellulose. Wawak.com, that's W-A-W-A-K dot com, sells some lovely acetate and Bemberg rayon linings with jacquard prints in basic neutral colors. Typically, acetate linings should be dry clean only. I've had good luck pre-shrinking acetate linings by putting them down into a bucket of really hot water, soaking them until the water cools and hanging them to dry. I avoid spinning off most linings in the machine since that can leave permanent wrinkles. Once the garment is made, I will actually dry clean it for best results, mostly so I don't disturb the meticulous shaping I've built into the garment. So all linings, whatever you use, should be pre-shrunk. I should mention that quilt fabric 
is usually too dense and has too much body for a jacket lining, I've had students use quilt fabrics for things like my 800 vest, where here I used linen. And in this case, the lining acts as a seam finish. So it needs to be more supportive than a typical acetate lining. But a jacket lining should be smooth and fluid, making getting in and out of the sleeves easy. Cutting out a lining is pretty straightforward. Use the same pattern pieces that you used for the garment. Because a lining needs to give and flex and not interfere with the movement of a jacket, especially in the case of a wool, like the Harris Tweed or the hand woven fabric, we have to create a center back release pleat in the lining. Otherwise, you'll be constantly ripping out the sleeve lining. Start with pre-shrunk folded fabric, wrong sides together. The fold will be along one long edge and the selvages are brought together at the opposite edge. Make sure you've straightened the cut edges so that they are on grain. I've already shot a video on straightening the edges of commercial fabric. Set the fold line of the center back one inch or two and a half centimeters from the fold of the fabric to create a two inch or five centimeter pleat down the center back. If you have a back pattern piece with a center back seam, place the seam line of the pattern one inch or two and a half centimeters from the fold. All the rest of the main body pieces are cut out to the pattern dimensions. To transfer the marks, I use either a black or white pencil, depending on the color of the lining, or for internal darts, dressmaker's tracing paper and a tracing wheel. Once all the pieces are cut, the first step, of course, is stay stitching. I've covered this in a previous video called First Steps. Stay stitch the shoulders and the front and back neckline, stitching half an inch or 1.2 centimeters from the cut edge with the direction of the grain. The next step is to stitch the pleat in the center back. Refold the back piece right sides together and press. So what I'm seeing here is the wrong side of the fabric. Measure in one inch or 2.5 centimeters from the fold at both the neck edge and the lower edge. Pin carefully. Now we're going to stitch down two inches from the neck edge at that one inch or two and a half centimeter mark and up from the lower edge about three inches or 7.6 centimeters at that same mark. You'll just want to clear the hem allowance. From the right side, fold out the pleat, pressing the pleat towards the right back and that would be towards the left when you are looking at the back from the right side. Create a crisp fold all the way down and press the lower edge as well. Stitch any darts on both the front and back pieces and press. Vertical darts press towards the center and horizontal darts press down. Now we have to sew the fronts and the backs together. We will use a French seam for this task. This is a self-encased seam that's easy to do and finishes off the seams beautifully, perfect when a lining isn't attached to the lower edge of the garment. If you like to use a walking foot, please replace it with your regular machine foot. 
A walking foot is overkill for aligning. I've seen too many students struggle unnecessarily. And I've covered this in more detail in a previous video. I'm rather fond of a basic straight stitch foot, commonly included with vintage machines, but usually a separate purchase with more modern versions. This first step is a bit counterintuitive, but start with the jacket fronts and backs wrong sides together. Pin what you know and make the rest fit. Stitch the seams from widest to narrowest. That is the hem to the underarm and the shoulder to armhole with a one quarter inch or six millimeter seam. Carefully trim away any of the hairs or ravels that stick up before we stitch the rest of the seam. Press the small seam allowances to one side. It doesn't matter which side, I prefer towards the back. Refold the jacket fronts and back right sides together and press the fold. Restitch all the seams with a 3 8 inch or 1 centimeter seam allowance. Press seams towards the back. Next, we will hem the lining. The jacket hem allowance is two inches or five centimeters. I want the lining for the jacket to be about a half inch or 1.2 centimeters shorter than the jacket since the jacket will most likely give or grow. So I'll turn under the lower edge of the lining a half an inch or 1.2 centimeters and press. Then I'll turn up the two inch or five centimeter hem allowance of the lining and press that as well.
carefully stitch the hem by machine using a longer stitch to give the hem a clean look. I usually stitch with the hem side up so that I can stitch a quarter inch or six millimeter from the edge of the hem allowance using my presser foot as a guide. Although the hem is clean and beautifully stitched, I don't like the beige thread, so I will actually remove this at a later date and replace it with one that matches a little closer. Sometimes you try to use something contrasty when you're doing a video, so I will change that later on. So for the sleeves, we construct them following the directions, the same as for the regular jacket sleeve, which I covered in a previous video. Create two parallel lines of basting from the dot or dots over the shoulder and down to the other dot or dots. Stitch the underarm seam with a French seam, beginning with the sleeve wrong sides together. And press the lower edge of the sleeve up one inch or 2.5 centimeters. This will allow for a release pleat in the lower edge of the sleeve once it's installed into the jacket. Next time, we'll insert the silk kimono lining into the handwoven jacket. I'm Daryl Lancaster for The Weaver Sews.